Monetary repression continues to be hidden and not spoken of in polite circles. The reality today for the 182 million people living in Sifa nations is that while they may be politically independent in name, their economies and money are still under colonial rule, and foreign powers still abuse and prolong that relationship to squeeze and exploit as much value from their societies and geographies as possible. The best in Bitcoin made audible. I am Guy Swan, and this is Bitcoin Audible. Man! Gladstein, Alex Gladstein just comes out with the heaviest of hitters. Uh, if you have not read his most recent piece that we're about to cover today on fighting monetary colonialism, do not go anywhere. It is amazing. Welcome to Bitcoin Audible, everybody. I am Guy Swan, the guy who has read more about Bitcoin than anybody else you know. Uh, let's give a quick shout out to Swan Bitcoin, the best and simplest savings plan for automatically stacking for your Bitcoin future. And if this article does not convince you that we are headed there, literally nothing will. Uh, and in that future, it is also critical that you keep your keys safe. The Bitbox O2 hardware wallet is the open source, easy to use, simple backup, secure AF hardware wallet for your Bitcoin keys. Uh, Guy GUI gets you 5% off the glorious Bitbox and all of your other security goodies from Shift Crypto. Uh, and guyswan.com. It's got both of these amazing Bitcoiner tools right at the top of the page. So don't have to remember anything except guyswan.com. It'll take you right there. All right. With that, let's get into this wild piece from Gladstein. Just another one smashed so far out of the park on the monetary colonialism of the Sifa nations across Africa. So without further ado, let's jump into today's read. And it's titled, Fighting Monetary Colonialism with Open Source Code, by Alex Gladstein. France still uses monetary colonialism to exploit 15 African nations. Could Bitcoin be a way out? In the fall of 1993, Fade Diop's family was saving up for his future. A brilliant 18-year-old living in Senegal, Fade had a bright path in front of him as a basketball player and an engineer. His father, a schoolteacher, had helped him find inspiration in computers and in connecting with the world around him, and his athletic talents had won him offers to study in Europe and in the United States. But when he woke up on the morning of January 12, 1994, everything had changed. Overnight, his family lost half its savings, not due to theft, bank robbery, or company bankruptcy, but a currency devaluation imposed by a foreign power based 5,000 kilometers away. The previous evening, French officials met with their African counterparts in Dakar to discuss the fate of the Franc de la Communauté Financière Africaine, or Franc of the Financial Community of Africa, known widely as the CFA Franc or CIFA for short. For Fade's entire life, his CIFA Franc had been pegged to the French Franc at a rate of 1 to 50, but when the late night meeting concluded, a midnight announcement set the new value at 1 to 100. The cruel irony was that the economic fate of millions of Senegalese was completely out of their own hands. No amount of protest could overthrow their economic masters. For decades, new presidents came and went, but the underlying financial arrangement never changed. Unlike a typical fiat currency, the system was far more insidious. It was monetary colonialism. The Mechanics of the Sifa System in their eye-opening book, Africa's Last Colonial Currency, The Sifa Frank Story, economic scholars Fanny Peugeot and Ndunga Sambasile 
tell the tragic and at times shocking history of the Sifa Frank. France, like other European powers, colonized many nations around the world in its imperial heyday, often brutally. After its occupation by Nazi Germany in World War II, the Empire Colonial Francois began to disintegrate. The French fought to keep their colonies, inflicting a massive human toll in the process. Despite waging a costly series of global wars, Indochina was lost, then Syria and Lebanon, and eventually French territory in North Africa, including cherished oil and gas-rich settler colony Algeria. But France was determined not to lose its territories in West and Central Africa. These had provided military manpower during the two world wars and offered a cornucopia of natural resources, including uranium, cocoa, timber, and bauxite, which had enriched and sustained the metropole. As 1960 approached, decolonialization seemed inevitable. Europe was united in disengaging from Africa after decades of depredations and state-sponsored looting. But the French authorities realized they could have their cake and eat it too, by ceding political control while retaining monetary control. This legacy still stands today in 15 countries that speak French and use a currency controlled by Paris. Senegal, Mali, Ivory Coast, Guinea-Bissau, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, Niger, Cameroon, Chad, the Central African Republic, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, the Republic of Congo, and the Comoros. In 2021, the French still exert monetary control over more than 2.5 million square kilometers of African territory, an area 80% the size of India. France began formal decolonization in 1956 with Le Cadre de Fer, a piece of legislation giving colonies more autonomy and creating democratic institutions and universal suffrage. In 1958, the French constitution was modified to establish La Communauté, the community, a group of autonomous, democratically administered overseas territories. President Charles de Gaulle toured colonies across West and Central Africa to offer autonomy without independence through La Communauté or immediate total independence. He made it clear there would be perks and stability with the former, and great risks and even chaos with the latter. In 1960, France actually had a larger population, around 40 million people, than the 30 million inhabitants of what are now the 15 Sifa nations. But today, 67 million people live in France and 183 million in the Sifa zone. According to UN projections, by the year 2100, France will have 74 million and the Sifa nations more than 800 million. Given that France still holds their financial destiny in its hands, the situation is increasingly resembling economic apartheid. When the Sifa franc was originally introduced in 1945, it was worth 1.7 French francs. In 1948, it was strengthened to 2 French francs. But by the time the Sifa franc was pegged to the euro at the end of the 1990s, it was worth 0.01 French francs. That is a total devaluation of 19,900%. Every time France devalued the Sifa franc, it increased its purchasing power against its former colonies and made it more expensive for them to import vital goods. In 1992, the French people were able to vote on whether or not to adopt the euro through a national referendum. The Sifa nationals were denied any such right and were excluded from the negotiations that would peg their money to a new currency. The exact mechanism of the Sifa system has evolved since its creation, but the core functionality and methods of exploitation are unchanged. They are described by what Peugeot and Sila call dependency theory where the resources of peripheral developing nations are, quote, continually drained to the benefit of core wealthy nations. The rich nations do not invest in income poor nations to make them richer. This exploitation evolved over time from brutal slavery regimes to the more sophisticated and less obvious means of maintaining political and economic servitude. Three central banks service the 15 Sifa nations today. 
the Banque Centrale d'État de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, or BCEAO for West African nations, the Banque d'État de l'Afrique Centrale, BEAC, for Central African nations, and the Banque Centrale des Comores, BCC, for the Comoros. The central banks hold the foreign exchange reserves, i.e. national savings, for the individual nations in their region, which must keep an astonishing 50% with the French treasury at all times. This number, high as it is, is a result of historical negotiations. Originally, the former colonies had to keep 100% of their reserves in France, and only in the 1970s did they earn the right to control some and cede just 65% to Paris. The CIFA nations have no discretion whatsoever with regard to their reserves stored abroad. In fact, they do not know how this money is spent. Meanwhile, Paris knows exactly how each CIFA nation's money is spent as it runs operation accounts for each country at the three central banks. As an example of how this works, when an Ivorian coffee company sells $1 million worth of goods to a Chinese buyer, the yuan from the purchaser gets exchanged into euros in a French currency market. Then the French treasury assumes the euros and credits the amount in CIFA francs to the Ivorian account at the BCEAO, which then credits the coffee maker's account domestically. Everything runs through Paris. According to Peugeot and Sila, France still manufactures all of the notes and coins used in the CIFA region, charging 45 million euros per year for the service and still holds 90% of the CIFA gold reserves, around 36.5 tons. The CIFA system confers five major benefits to the French government. Bonus reserves to use at its discretion, big markets for expensive exports and cheap imports, the ability to purchase strategic minerals in its domestic currency without running down its reserves, favorable loans when CIFA nations are in credit, and favorable interest rates when they are in debt. For stretches of history, the French inflation rate has even exceeded the loan interest rate, meaning, in effect, France was forcing CIFA nations to pay a fee to store their reserves abroad. And finally, a double loan, in which a CIFA nation will borrow money from France and, in looking to deploy the capital, have little choice given the perverse macroeconomic circumstances but to contract with French companies. This means the loan principle immediately returns to France, but the African nation is still saddled with both principle and interest. This leads to a kind of petrodollar recycling phenomenon, similar to how Saudi Arabia would take dollars earned through oil sales and invest them into U.S. treasuries. As CIFA exporters historically would sell raw materials to France, with part of the proceeds being collected by the regional central bank and reinvested back into the metropole's debt through French, or today, European government debt. And then there is the selective convertibility of the CIFA franc. Businesses can easily sell their CIFA francs for euros today, previously French francs, but citizens carrying CIFA francs outside of their central bank zone cannot exchange them formally anywhere. They're about as useless as postcards. If an Ivorian is leaving her country, she must exchange the notes for euros first, where the French Treasury and the European Central Bank, ECB, extract seniorage through the exchange rate. The monetary repression at play is that France forces the CIFA nations to keep a huge amount of reserves in Parisian coffers, preventing the Africans from creating domestic credit. The regional central banks end up loaning out very little at very high rates, instead of loaning out more at low rates. And the CIFA nations end up, against their wishes, buying French or today European debt with their strategic reserves. The most surprising part, perhaps, is the special privilege of first right of refusal on imports and exports. If you are a Malian cotton producer, you must first offer your goods to France before you go to the international markets. Or if you're in Benin and want to build a new infrastructure project, you must consider French bids before others. This has historically meant that France has been able to access cheaper-than-market goods from its former colonies and sell its own goods and services for higher-than-market prices.
Peugeot and Sila called this the continuation of the Colonial Pact, which was centered around four fundamental tenets. Quote, the colonies were forbidden from industrializing and had to content themselves with supplying raw materials to the metropole, which transformed them into finished products, which were then resold to the colonies. The metropole enjoyed the monopoly of colonial exports and imports, it also held a monopoly in the shipping of colonial products abroad. Finally, the Metropole granted commercial preferences to the products of the colonies, end quote. The result is a situation in which, quote, the central banks have ample foreign exchange reserves remunerated at low or even negative rates in real terms, in which commercial banks hold excess liquidity, where access to household and corporate credit is rationed, and in which the states are increasingly obliged in order to finance their development projects to contract foreign currency loans at unsustainable interest rates, which further encourages capital flight. Today, the SIFA system has been Africanized, meaning the notes now show African culture and flora and fauna on them, and the central banks are located in Dakar, Yaoundé, and Moroni. But these are only superficial changes. The banknotes are still made in Paris. The operation accounts are still run by French authorities, and French officials still sit on the boards of the regional central banks and hold de facto veto power. It is a remarkable situation where a citizen of Gabon has a French bureaucrat making decisions on her behalf. Just as if the ECB or the Federal Reserve had Japanese or Russians making decisions for Europeans and Americans. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have historically worked in concert with France to enforce the CIFA system, and rarely, if ever, criticize its exploitative nature. In fact, as part of the post-World War II Bretton Woods system, where Americans would lead the World Bank and Europeans would lead the IMF, the position of IMF managing director has often been held by a French official, most recently Christine Lagarde. Over the years, the IMF has helped the French pressure CIFA nations to pursue its desired policies. A prominent example was in the early 1990s, when the Ivory Coast did not want to devalue its currency, but the French were pushing for such a change. According to Peugeot and Sila, quote, At the end of 1991, the IMF refused to continue lending money to the Ivory Coast, offering the country two options. Either the country reimbursed the debts contracted with the fund, or it accepted devaluation, end quote. The Ivory Coast and other CIFA nations caved and accepted devaluation three years later. Contradicting the values of liberté, égalité, and fraternité, French officials have propped up tyrants in the CIFA zone for the past six decades. For example, three men, Omar Bongo in Gabon, Paul Bia in Cameroon, and Nasimba Eadima in Togo have amassed 120 years in power between them. All would have been tossed out by their people far sooner had the French not provided cash, weapons, and diplomatic cover. According to Peugeot and Sila, between 1960 and 1991, quote, Paris carried out nearly 40 military interventions in 16 countries to defend its interests. That number is certainly higher today. Over time, the CIFA system has served to allow the French state to exploit the resources and labor of the CIFA nations without allowing them to deepen their accumulation of capital and develop their own export-led economies. The results have been catastrophic for human development. Today, the Ivory Coast's inflation-adjusted GDP per capita in dollars is around 1700 compared with 2,500 in the late 1970s. In Senegal, it wasn't until 2017 that inflation-adjusted GDP per capita surpassed the heights reached in the 1960s. As Peugeot and Sila note, quote, 10 states of the franc zone recorded their highest levels of average income before the 2000s. In the last 40 years, the average purchasing power has deteriorated almost everywhere. In Gabon, the highest average income was recorded in 1976, just under $20,000. Forty years later, it has shrunk by half. 
Guinea-Bissau joined the CIFA system in 1997, the year in which it recorded the peak in its average income. 19 years later, this fell by 20%. End quote. A staggering 10 of the 15 CIFA nations are considered among the least developed countries in the world by the United Nations, alongside the likes of Haiti, Yemen, and Afghanistan. In various international rankings, Niger, the Central African Republic, Chad, and Guinea-Bissau are often counted as the poorest countries in the world. The French are maintaining, in effect, an extreme version of what Alan Farrington has called the capital strip mine. Singalese politician Amedou Laminagaya once summed up the CIFA system as citizens having, quote, only duties and no rights, and that, quote, the task of the colonized territories was to produce a lot, to produce beyond their own means, and to produce to the detriment of their more immediate interests in order to allow the metropole a better standard of living and a safer supply. The Metropole, of course, resists this description. As French economic minister Michel Serpent said in April 2017, France is there as a friend. Now, the reader may ask, do African countries resist this exploitation? The answer is yes, but they pay a heavy price. Early nationalist leaders from the African independence era recognized the critical value of economic freedom. Quote, Independence is only the prelude to a new and more involved struggle for the right to conduct our own economic and social affairs, unhampered by crushing and humiliating neo-colonialist control and interference, declared Kwame Nkrumah in 1963, who led the movement that made Ghana the first independent nation in sub-Saharan Africa. But throughout the history of the Sifa region, national leaders who stood up to the French authorities have tended to fare poorly. In 1958, Guinea tried to claim monetary independence. In a famous speech, firebrand nationalist Seko Touré said to a visiting Charles de Gaulle, quote, We would rather have poverty in freedom than opulence in slavery. And shortly thereafter, left the Sifa system. According to the Washington Post, quote, In reaction and as a warning to other French-speaking territories, the French pulled out of Guinea over a two-month period, taking everything they could with them. They unscrewed light bulbs, removed plans for sewage pipelines in Conakry, the capital, and even burned medicines rather than leave them for the Guineans. Next, as an act of destabilizing retribution, the French launched, the French launched Operation Persil during which, according to Peugeot and Sila, the French intelligence counterfeited huge quantities of the New Guinean banknotes and then poured them en masse into the country. The result, they write, was the collapse of the Guinean economy. The country's democratic hopes were dashed along with its finances, as Touré was able to cement his power in the chaos and begin 26 years of brutal rule. In June 1962, Mali's independence leader, Modibo Keita, announced that Mali was leaving the Sifa zone to mint its own currency. Keita explained in detail the reasons for the move, such as economic overdependence. 80% of Mali's imports came from France, the concentration of decision making powers in Paris, and the stunting of economic diversification and growth. Quote, it is true that the wind of decolonialization has passed over the old edifice but without shaking it too much, he said about the status quo. In response, the French government rendered the Malian franc inconvertible. A deep economic crisis followed, and Keita was overthrown in a military coup in 1968. Mali eventually chose to re-enter the Sifa zone, but the French imposed two devaluations on the Malian franc as conditions for reinstatement and did not allow re-entry until 1984. In 1969, when President Hamani Diori of Niger asked for a more flexible arrangement where his country would have more monetary independence, the French refused. They threatened him by withholding payment for the uranium that they were harvesting from the desert mines that would give France energy independence through nuclear power. Six years later, Diori's government was overthrown by General Saini Conche, 
three days before a planned meeting to renegotiate the price of the Nigerian uranium. Diori wanted to raise the price, but his former colonial master disagreed. The French army was stationed nearby during the coup, but as Peugeot and Sila dryly noted, they did not lift a finger. In 1985, the revolutionary military leader Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso was asked in an interview, quote, Is the Sifa Franc not a weapon for the domination of Africa? Does Burkina Faso plan to continue carrying this burden? Why does an African peasant in his village need a convertible currency? Sankara replied, If the currency is convertible or not has never been the concern of the African peasant. He has been plunged against his will into an economic system against which he is defenseless. Sankara was assassinated two years later by his best friend and second-in-command, Blaise Campare. No trial was ever held. Instead, Campare seized power and ruled until 2014, a loyal and brutal servant of the Sifa system. Farida Naborema's Struggle for Togolese Financial Freedom in December 1962, Togo's first post-colonial leader, Silvanus Olympio, formally moved to create a central bank of Togo and a Togolese franc. But on the morning of January 13, 1963, days before he was about to cement this transition, he was shot dead by Togolese soldiers who had received training in France. Nasimbe Ayadima was one of the soldiers who committed the crime. He later seized power and became Togo's dictator with full French support, ruling for more than five decades and promoting the Sifa Franc until his death in 2005. His son rules to this day. Olympio's murder has never been solved. Farida Nabarema's family has always been involved in the struggle for human rights in Togo. Her father was an active leader of the opposition and has served time as a political prisoner. His father opposed the French during colonial times. Today, she is a leading figure in the country's democracy movement. Farida was 15 years old when she learned that the history of Togo's dictatorship was intertwined with the Sifa Franc. By that time in the early 2000s, she had started to get close to her father and asked him questions about her country's history. Why did our first president get assassinated just a few years after we gained independence? She inquired. The answer? He resisted the Sifa Franc. In 1962, Olympio began the movement toward financial independence from France. The parliament voted in favor of beginning such a transition and of creating a Togolese Franc and holding their reserves in their own central bank. Farida was shocked to learn that Olympio was assassinated just two days before Togo was supposed to leave the Sifa arrangement. As she put it, quote, His decision to seek monetary freedom was seen as an affront to hegemony in Francophone Africa. They were afraid others would follow. Today, she says, for many Togolese activists, the Sifa is the major reason to seek broader freedom. Quote, it is what animates many in the opposition movement. The reasons why are clear. Farida said France keeps more than half of Togo's reserves in its banks, where the Togolese people have zero oversight over how those reserves are spent. Often, these reserves, earned by Togolese, are used to buy French debt to finance the activities of the French people. In effect, this money is often loaned to the former colonial master at negative real yield. The Togolese are paying Paris to hold their money for them and in the process, financing the living standards of the French people. In 1994, the devaluation that stole the savings from Fode Diop's family in Senegal hit Togo hard, too, causing a huge increase in national debt, a reduction in public funding to local infrastructure, and an increase in poverty. Remember, Farida said, our government is forced to prioritize holding our reserves in the French bank over spending at home. So when a shock hits, we have to degrade ourselves to ensure that a proper amount of cash is in Parisian hands. This creates a national climate of dependence, where Togolese are forced to ship raw goods out and bring finished goods in, never digging their way out. 
Farida said that about 10 years ago, the anti-SIFA movement started to gain more traction. Because of mobile phones and social media, people were able to unite and organize in a decentralized manner. It used to just be Ivorians and Togolese struggling separately, she said. But now there is a regional effort between activists. For decades, there has been the idea of an eco-currency for all of the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS nations, including regional economic powerhouses Nigeria and Ghana. Farida said that the French tried to hijack this plan, seeing it as a way to expand their own financial empire. In 2013, then-President François Hollande formed a commission which created a document for the French future in Africa. In it, they stated it was an imperative to get Anglophone countries like Ghana involved. Emmanuel Macron's administration is now trying to rename the CIFA franc to the ECO, in a continuing process of Africanizing the French colonial financial system. Nigeria and Ghana backed out of the ECO project once they realized the French were going to continue to have control. Nothing has formally happened yet, but the countries currently managed by the BCEAO Central Bank are on track to switch to this eco currency by 2027. The French will still have decision making ability, and there are not any formal plans to adjust the central banking of the Central African CIFA nations or of Comoros. It is the high point of hypocrisy for French leaders like Macron to go to Davos and say they are done with colonialism, Farida said, while in fact, they are trying to expand it. She said that originally, the CIFA franc was created on the basis of the currency plan used by the Nazi occupiers of France. During World War II, Germany created a national currency for the French colonies so it could easily control imports and exports by just using one financial layer. When the war ended and the French regained their freedom, they decided to use the exact same model for their colonies. So, Farida said, the foundation of the Sifa Frank is really a Nazi one. The system has a dark genius to it, in that the French have been able to, over time, print money to buy vital goods from their former colonies, but those African countries have to work to earn reserves. It's not fair. It's not independence, Farida said. It's pure exploitation. France claims that the system is good because it provides stability, low inflation, and convertibility for the Togolese people. But the convertibility tends to end up facilitating capital flight, when it is easy for businesses to flee the CIFA and park their profits in euros today, while trapping the Togolese in a seniorage regime. Whenever the CIFA is converted, and it must be, as it cannot be used outside of a citizen's economic zone, the French and the ECB take their slice. Yes, Farida said, inflation is low in Togo compared to independent nations, but a lot of their earnings are going to fight inflation instead of supporting infrastructure and industry growth at home. She pointed to the growth of Ghana, which has an independent monetary policy and higher inflation over time than the Sifa nations compared to Togo. By any metric, healthcare, middle-class growth, unemployment, Ghana is superior. In fact, when one zooms out, she said that not a single CIFA nation is among the 10 richest countries in Africa, but of the bottom 10 poorest, half are in the CIFA zone. Farida says that French colonialism goes beyond money. It also affects education and culture. For example, she said the World Bank gives $130 million per year to support Francophone countries to pay for their books for public schools. Farida says 90% of these books are printed in France. The money goes directly from the World Bank to Paris, not to Togo or to any other African nation. The books are brainwashing tools, Farida said. They focus on the glory of French culture and undermine the achievements of other nations, whether they be American, Asian, or African. In high school, Farida asked her dad, Do people use any other language but French in Europe? He laughed. They only learned about French history, French inventors, and French philosophers. She grew up thinking that the only smart people were French. She had never read an American or British book before she traveled abroad for the first time. 
In general, Farida said, French Africa consumes 80% of the books that the French print. President Macron wants to expand on this dominance and has promised to spend hundreds of millions of euros to boost French in Africa, declaring that it could be the first language of the continent and calling it a language of freedom. Given current trends, by 2050, 85% of all French speakers could live in Africa. Language is one pillar of support for the Sifa Franks' survival. Politics is another. An important part of the Sifa system is French support for dictatorship. With the exception of Senegal, not a single Sifa bloc country has ever had meaningful democratization. Every single successful tyrant in Francophone Africa, Farida said, has had the full backing of the French state. Whenever there is a coup against democracy, the French support the coup makers as long as they are friendly to the Sifa regime. But the moment anyone has anti-French tendencies, you see sanctions, threats, or even assassinations. Farida points to the example of Chad and Mali today. Both countries are under threat from terrorism and rebellion. In Chad, late military dictator Idris Deby was propped up by France for three decades until his death in April. According to the Chadian constitution, the head of the parliament is normally next in line to be president. But instead, the military installed Deby's son, a general in the army. The French government applauded this illegal transition, and President Macron even visited Chad two months ago to celebrate this sham. In a tribute speech, he called Deby a friend and courageous soldier, and said, quote, France will not let anybody put into question or threaten today or tomorrow Chad's stability and integrity. The son, of course, will promote the Sifa Frank. Mali, on the other hand, Farida said, had a coup a month after Chad's. The junta and the population are not as friendly to Paris and appear to be seeking in Russia a new partner to stymie terrorism. So the French government has called the coup unacceptable is threatening to withdraw troops from Mali to leave them alone with the terrorists, as Farida said, and is preparing sanctions. Mali is being punished by France for doing the same thing that Chad did. There is despotism and corruption on both sides. The only difference is that Mali wanted to move away from French monetary control, while Chad is still cooperating. When you are a dictator, as long as you are working for France, they will continue finding excuses to help you stay in power, said Farida. They did the same in 2005 in her country of Togo, which led to a son taking over from his dictator father and to her own political awakening. Fode Diop's mission to bring Bitcoin to Senegal. All right, we will jump back in on this section, but let's take a quick break. I definitely need something to drink and let's hit our sponsor for today. All right, so you don't put your Bitcoin keys in the basket by the door. You don't put them under your bed and you always have a backup and you secure them in a strong hardware vault, the Bitbox O2. Best thing about this wallet, in my opinion, is just how easy it is to use and set up. So the micro SD card backup, I think, is a really clever way to simplify the idea of what you are keeping safe as your backup. I've obviously, I always do a paper backup as well but I like having the micro SD card. And then it's also open source, which is really important for security. And I personally advise the Bitcoin only Bitbox doesn't do as much, so less can go wrong. Uh, and the Bitbox is Swiss made. So you can sound really cool when you tell people that you keep your Bitcoin keys, the quote unquote Swiss bank account in your pocket in a literal digital Swiss vault. That's a Bitbox only feature, so keep that in mind. Discount code GUY gets you 5% off this bad boy and any of the other goodies you want from the Shift Crypto store. And you can go directly there at guyswan.com slash bitbox. And don't wait until you need a bitbox. Go ahead and get your hardware wallet. guyswan.com slash bitbox. Fode Diop's mission to bring Bitcoin to Senegal. It was not until Fode Diop had the opportunity to travel to the U.S. that he could start to look at his country, Senegal, from the outside. At first, the 1994 devaluation of the Sifa Franc 
had put his academic future in jeopardy. He had an opportunity to go study and play basketball at a university in Kansas, but his family's savings had been destroyed. Luckier than most around him, his family had one more option. His father had book rights for teaching materials that he had created, and he was able to use those to borrow what was needed to get Fodi to school. One day, a few years after graduating from college, while living in the U.S. and working on a new video-on-demand site with his brother, Fode stumbled across a YouTube video of Dr. Tchek Anta Diop, a Singhalese scientist and historian, talking about how money and language were tools of controlling people's minds and livelihoods. Fode had heard about Dr. Diop before. The biggest university in Senegal was named after him but he had not listened to his critique of the Sifa system. It hit Fode hard. He says it was like the moment in The Matrix, one of his favorite movies, when Neo takes the red pill from Morpheus and breaks out of his pod into the jarringly brutal real world. He finally saw the water that he swam in while growing up. This was the first time in my life I started thinking for myself, Fode said. The first time when I realized my own country's currency was a mechanism of control. He said that it is more than just control over currency. Because the French print and control the money through each country's operation accounts, they have data. They know what's going where. They have information on all the countries. They have an edge over these countries. They know who is corrupt. They know who is buying property in France. They know what is available. They have first right of refusal on preferential import and export pricing. They have total domination, said Fode. He would later reflect on the 1994 devaluation. At the time, he was only 18, so he did not understand what had happened other than the fact that the family's finances had gotten a lot more difficult. They put a bag over your head so that you don't notice your reality, he said. But in retrospect, there was a big public debate about it. People realized that when they would go to convert the French franc, They would only get half as much for their money, even though they were doing the same amount of work. The French reasoning, Fode said, was to make exports cheaper so that the African countries could produce more competitively. But Fode sees it differently. This allowed France to crack the whip and buy cheaper goods. Fode would have two more red pill moments. The next came in 2007 when he was working in Las Vegas in the technology scene. He was watching a video of Steve Jobs, who had just announced the iPhone to the world. Fode was stunned. A mobile phone that had a native touchscreen browser. The same thing that was on your computer was now on your phone. He knew instantly it would change the world. His next thought? How do we get native payments into the iPhone apps so people with no bank accounts and credit cards could use mobile money? The final red pill for Fode was learning about Bitcoin in 2010. He was living in Los Angeles when he first read Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper for a peer-to-peer electronic cash system. From the moment he read it, Fode thought, for the first time, we have a weapon to fight back against oppression and colonialism. Money of the people, not controlled by governments. This, he said, is exactly what we need. Years earlier, Fode had read Out of Control by Kevin Kelly. One of the chapters was about e-currencies. He knew that eventually all money would be digital, part of a great global electronic revolution. But he had never thought too deeply about the transformative power digital money could have until Bitcoin. What is money? Where does it come from? Asking these questions, this is what Bitcoin did for me, he said. Before that, you don't question it. Maybe he thought one day France would not have the right or ability to print and control the money of the Singhalese people anymore. Faudet and his roommate in Las Vegas would stay up late many times over the coming years thinking about what Bitcoin could make possible for payments, savings, and all economic activity. He learned about what happened when you swiped your credit card, what kind of information this revealed and what third parties were doing with that information. He thought that the marriage of the smartphone and Bitcoin would make an incredible empowerment tool. Fode would frequently go back to Senegal 
and each time he would go, he would bring a bunch of phones with him to give away. He viewed them as connections to the outside world for his friends back home. Over the coming years, he worked at different startups, all in the industry of digitizing different parts of our lives. In 2017, he left Vegas and went to San Francisco. He joined a coding boot camp and decided to become a computer engineer. Initially, he got very involved with the cryptocurrency scene as a whole, but eventually he says he, quote, fell out of love with Ethereum, right around the time he started to go to San Francisco's Socratic seminars with River founder Alex Leishman. He met a lot of the Bitcoin Core developers and early Lightning users. In 2019, he won a transportation hackathon, making a Lightning invoice that would unlock a Tesla. This gave him a big confidence boost that he could help change the world. He decided to go home to Senegal to spread Bitcoin education. On his way, he was gifted a travel scholarship to the Lightning Conference in Berlin by Lightning Labs CEO Elizabeth Stark. There, he met Richard Myers of Gotenna and developer Will Clark, who were thinking about how to fight internet censorship with mesh networks. Fode thought, in Senegal, the French telecom, Orange, controls all the phone networks. Maybe they could figure out a way to circumvent French control over communications and ability to turn off the internet through Bitcoin and Lightning. Senegal's telecom gateways are controlled by France and can be shut down in case there are protests against the country's leader, whom they support as long as he sticks to the CIFA system. But it is possible to find endpoints, Fode said, through other providers. They could be other national phone networks or even satellite connections. Fode created a box that would pick up on these other signals. Mobile phones could tunnel into that box, allowing users to go online even when the French turned off the internet. To incentivize people running such boxes, he would pay them in Bitcoin. For routing data and maintaining these boxes in Senegal, one is paid through Lightning. This is what Fode is working on today. It's very risky, Fode said. You can face jail or fines, but with monetary incentives, people are willing. The next time Orange turns off the internet to protect its ally and government, the people may have a way to communicate that the regime cannot stop. Lightning, Fode said, is everything. We need instant and cheap payments. We can't do on-chain Bitcoin payments. The fees are just too expensive. We have to use Lightning. There is no other option, he said. And it works. This rings especially true in the area of remittances, which, according to the World Bank, are a major source of GDP for many CIFA nations. For example, 14.5% of Comoros' GDP is based on remittances. For Senegal, it is 10.7%. Guinea-Bissau, 9.8%. Togo, 8.4%. And Mali, 6%. Given that the average cost of sending a $200 remittance to Sub-Saharan Africa is 8%, and that the average cost of sending $500 is 9%, and given that Bitcoin-based remittance services like Strike can reduce fees to well under 1%, anywhere from 0.5% to a full 1% of CIFA Nation's GDP could be saved by adopting a Bitcoin model. Zooming out. Each year, roughly $700 billion is sent home by remitters globally. Between $30 billion and $40 billion could be saved, which is roughly the same amount the U.S. spends each year on foreign aid. Fode understands why people in the West might be skeptical about Bitcoin. If you have Venmo and Cash App, you might not see why it is important. You have all the conveniences of a modern monetary system. But when you go to Senegal, more than 70% of our people have never stepped foot in a bank. Mom never had a credit card or debit card, he said. He wonders, how are they ever going to participate in the global financial system? He said the marriage of smartphones and Bitcoin will liberate people and change society. Fode mentioned the mobile wave the book that MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor wrote about the handheld revolution as being so salient. 
When Faudet first touched the iPhone, he knew that it was what he was waiting for. The universe was conspiring, he thought. In just a few short years, he saw the iPhone, the great financial crisis, Satoshi's release of Bitcoin, and his own transition to becoming an American citizen. He said that since he has spent half of his life in Africa and half in the U.S., that he can see a path forward. When I go home, I see how people are being held down. But in the same way we leapfrogged landlines and went straight to cell phones, we're going to skip banks and go straight to Bitcoin. Another effect he is seeing in Senegal is that when people are exposed to Bitcoin, they start saving. Today at home, I'm thinking about how to help people save money, he said. Nobody saves anything here. They just spend every CIFA franc they can get. Faudet is forever grateful for the BTC that Leishman gave him, as he ended up giving it away in small parts to people in Senegal, those who came to events or who asked good questions. People saw its value grow over time. He has watched what has happened in El Salvador with great excitement. When he stood in a conference hall in Miami earlier this month and listened to strike founder Jack Mallers announce that a country had added Bitcoin as legal tender, Faudet said that he teared up. He thought this would never happen. What began as a store of value is now evolving to a medium of exchange, he said. El Salvador has some similarities to the CIFA zone countries. It is a poorer nation, fixed to a foreign currency, reliant on imports, with a weaker export base. Its monetary policy is controlled by an external power. 70% of the country is unbanked, and 22% of the nation's GDP relies on remittances. If it could be a good option for them, Fode thought, maybe it could work for us. But he knows there are major obstacles. One is the French language. There's not a lot of French information on GitHub or in the documentation materials for Lightning or Bitcoin Core. Currently, Faudet is working on translating some of this to French so that the local developer community can get more involved. Could a Bitcoin Beach community eventually happen in Senegal? Yes, Faudet said. This is why he moved back, and that is why he is running meetups, collecting donations through a Lightning tip jar, and building a citizen-powered, Bitcoin-based version of Radio Free Europe. They could jail me, he said, but through the meetups, I'm making it so that I'm not a single point of failure. He thinks it will be hard to get Bitcoin adoption in Senegal because of the French influence. They won't go out without a fight, he said. As Nongo Sambasia put it, Today, France faces relative economic decline in a region it long considered its own private preserve, even faced with the rise of other powers like China. France has no intention of abdicating its mastery. It will fight to the last. But maybe, instead of a violent revolution, it could be a gradual, peaceful revolution over time that kicks out colonialism. Not a sudden off switch, but a parallel system where people can opt in over time by themselves, Faudet said. No coercion. As for people who think we should just ask the government to protect our rights. They don't know that democracies like France have this bad side, Faudet said. They won't gift us liberty. Instead, we should follow in the footsteps of the cypherpunks and seize our freedoms with open source code. When asked about Bitcoin's chances at replacing central banking, Faudet said that the idea may sound crazy to Americans, but for Senegalese or Togolese, Central banks are a parasite on our society. We have to fight back. Faudet considers Bitcoin life-changing. Never before did we have a system where money could be minted in a decentralized fashion. But this is what we have today. It is a solution for those who need it most. For the first time, we have a powerful tool to push back against oppression, he said. It might not be perfect, but we got to use the tools we have today to fight for the people, not wait around for someone to come help us. The Separation of Money and State In 1980, Cameroonian economist Joseph Chunchong Puemi wrote, Monnaie servitude et liberté, la répression monétaire de l'Afrique. The thesis 
Monetary dependence is the foundation of all other forms of dependence. The final words of the book ring especially strong today. Africa's fate will be forged through money, or it won't be forged at all. Money and currency are buried beneath the surface in the global human rights movement. They hardly ever come up at human rights conferences and are rarely discussed among activists. But ask a democracy advocate from an authoritarian regime about money, and they will tell amazing and tragic stories. Demonetization in Eritrea and North Korea. Hyperinflation in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. State surveillance in China and Hong Kong. Frozen payments in Belarus and Nigeria. And economic firewalls in Iran and Palestine. And now, monetary colonialism in Togo and Senegal. Without financial freedom, movements and NGOs cannot sustain themselves. If their bank accounts are shuttered, notes demonetized or funds debased, their power is limited and tyranny marches on. Monetary repression continues to be hidden and not spoken of in polite circles. The reality today for the 182 million people living in SIFA nations is that while they may be politically independent in name, their economies and money are still under colonial rule, and foreign powers still abuse and prolong that relationship to squeeze and exploit as much value from their societies and geographies as possible. In recent years, SIFA zone citizens are increasingly rising up. The slogan, France dégage, has become a rallying cry. But the system's loudest critics, Peugeot and Sila among them, do not seem to offer a viable alternative. They dismiss the status quo and IMF bondage, only to suggest either a regional currency controlled by local leaders or a system where each SIFA nation creates and runs its own currency. But just because Senegal or Togo get monetary independence from France does not guarantee that they will perform well or that the country's leaders will not abuse the currency. There is still the threat of domestic dictatorial misrule or new capture by Russian or Chinese foreign powers. It is clear that people are in need of a money that actually breaks the wheel, one that they can control and that cannot be manipulated by governments of any kind. Just as there was a historic separation of church and state that paved the way for a more prosperous and free kind of human society, a separation of money and state is underway. Could citizens of SIFA nations over time, with increasing access to the internet, popularize Bitcoin to the point that governments would be forced to de facto adopt it, like what happened in Latin American countries like Ecuador, with Dolaresion Populaire. History remains to be written, but one thing is for sure. The World Bank and IMF will resist any trends in this direction. Already they have come out swinging against El Salvador. A few weeks ago, the actor Hill Harper was quoted in the New York Times regarding his activism for Bitcoin in the African American community. He said quite simply, they can't colonize Bitcoin. Farida Nabarema agrees. Bitcoin, she said, is the first time ever that there is money that is actually decentralized and accessible to anyone in the world regardless of their skin color, ideology, nationality, amount of wealth, or colonial past. She said it is the people's currency and even goes a step further. Maybe, she said, we should call Bitcoin the currency of decolonialization. You know, a lot of the details that Alex Gladstein covers in this article were new to me. I didn't, I could not have told you any of the details about the CIFA zone and how that currency works or, you know, a lot of the central bank details in, uh, you know, just across Africa. But I know that this situation is not uncommon. Um, in fact, everything that I've read in this article, despite being absurd and obvious ploys to control and subjugate someone 
none of it was shocking. None of it was shocking in the sense that I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe this is happening. This is how I assumed it was happening. I just didn't have details on how or you know, where or why. And I think as you dig into monetary history, like as, as you really begin to explore this, you realize that this is, this, is not, this is not even an uncommon story. This is the story of money. Money has always been used as a tool of subjugation and control. When you see a great war in history, go, go look 10 to 20 years before. There are, there's always some event, like something. It's like, oh, this is what started this great war, which is almost always some trite or like, oh, for humanitarian reasons, or this dude got assassinated, or we needed to bring freedom to these people, some absurd nonsense like that, which is never the truth. But go back 10 years, 20 years before that, and start learning about what was happening to their currency, what was happening to the money. Almost without fail, you find a very interesting and dirty and corrupt story. And it should be obvious, but so many of us too easily, or it's not even too easily, it's just the state of things. When, when you're fed propaganda, all you know is propaganda. Just like Fode talked about like up to 18, just never, never thought anything outside of what he knew in the world. Uh, Farida even said that, you know, does anybody speak anything other than French? Um, and, you know, just only French scientists, only French inventors, et cetera, et cetera. Like you, you just get this, this bubble of the world because it's not good for a country's image. It's if they are, if they are the power, that is how they keep the political power, is that you are almighty in their eyes. This is why every government has always given, quote unquote, free education. Like, it's the Prussian school system. It's how do you create, it's how do you propagandize people. And I don't, and, you know, honestly, I don't even care if you think that's silly. Like, we, the United States adopted the Prussian school system, like, like point for point. It's how the, the exact same thing that was done in Germany uh, leading up to the Nazis was built here. It's a manufacturing plant to get people to think and believe a certain set of things uh, in a 20-year plan to just shove them through this machine so that everybody's the same on the other end. And it doesn't even have to be some big conspiracy. I mean, I, I think the idea of governments not, not being in the business of knowing how to control and gain political power over their people is absurd. Like, I, I've, that's, that's exactly what they do. That's the whole institution. So to think that they don't treat this like a science project, like anybody would of anything, like, of course they do. Of course they do. Read a little Machiavelli, the, the guy who would say out loud the things you weren't allowed to say out loud. And Gladstein talks about in this piece, you know, monetary repression continues to be hidden. We don't speak about it in polite circles. Just don't talk about it. Everything's cool. And the thing not to talk about these days is just how much power, access, and monopoly over the financial system, and access and monopoly over the money, how much power that gives to one country over another if they can make that other country use theirs. This is the petrodollar. This is the euro. This is the CIFA franc. This is the game of currency where political power is established and expressed in the power of your money. When money is attached to the state, when it is attached to the political apparatus, and all these countries are competing with each other, the power of the currency is the power of the state. There's a great quote um, in, in this piece. I've got my, my little sections here that I just thought. I mean, there's so much great stuff in this piece. Um, but this section, the framing here, I think, is so, so desperately important to understand is that the idea, the facade of colonialization, the, the facade of just one country conquering another has fallen away, but the tools, the, the simple reality is that the tools they use to do so have changed to something that's just harder to distinguish. 
You know, that's the, that's the whole purpose of politics, right? Like the game is one of obtaining and spreading power, period. That is the whole thing. It is always behind a facade of stability or creating integrity for the Sifa nations or bringing freedom to the Middle East or whatever stupid reason they have. It's always, it is literally their job to sell their political ambitions as something nice and flowery and amazing. And money is the ultimate tool for them to do that with. As, so the quote here, as 1960 approached, decolonialization seemed inevitable. Europe was united in disengaging from Africa after decades of depredations and state-sponsored looting. But the French authorities realized they could have their cake and eat it too, by ceding political control while retaining monetary control. The point of the political control is to control the resources. So if you can do that with the money and give the facade of giving political freedom, you can literally have your cake and eat it too. You can make it appear as if you've become less colonial, that you're, you're supporting all the freedom of these nations, but we just, need to deal, we just need to work out your finances. And yes, we're going to take a huge fee. Yes, we're going to say that you can't use anybody else for your, you know, working out your finances. Yes, I am going to be able to cook my books with the points on your books. Yes, I am going to involve myself in your elections. I am going to manipulate the views and the access to information of the people of your country to support the candidates that are favorable to us. But don't worry, it's all for your own good. Monetary dominance is essentially a back door for tyranny. It's, it's a way to walk out the front door and act like you're leaving and still pull the strings as you go. And it's not even just, it's not even just forcing them to use your bank, forcing them to hold money in your treasury, but giving them loans in a currency that you can debase at an interest rate that you monopolize is not a way to help them. You know, I was talking about this with, um, BTC Sessions, they did a, uh, did a Why Are We Bullish episode um, last week, and uh, Lord Fisichua on, uh, from uh, the Kingdom of Tonga was on, and he talks about this, is like, you know, like, that's not, that's not freedom. Like, to get a loan from someone makes you dependent on them, and when they charge interest rates or give you savings, it's such a ridiculous arrangement that you have to hold it in bonds or or debts of France that are negative real yielding it's just bleeding them in every possible way that they can be bled so that the money flows into France and none of it none of it can build up capital and infrastructure and an actual healthy economy in the actual country that it's from and it's exactly the tool they use to screw them over if they ever step out of line. That's another quote from this. It's quote, at the end of 1991, the IMF refused to continue lending money to the Ivory Coast, offering the country two options. Either the country reimbursed the debts contracted with the fund, or it accepted devaluation. The Ivory Coast and other CFA nations caved and accepted devaluation three years later. That's not a choice, right? That's not a choice. It's because they are indebted to them. Pay back everything that you owe us right now. Like we're just gonna we're just gonna bust in and basically repossess everything that we've ever lent you, which was to help you, of course. Or you're going to accept that we just take half of everything that you have ever. Like like we're just gonna completely devalue the currency and you are screwed. We take we take half of your wages, we take half of your savings, it's all ours. That's like giving someone the option of getting shot in the chest or shot in the stomach. What Bitcoin does for this is insane. The idea of a, and an independent currency to even prevent, not just prevent the control of France over the Sifa nations, but even better to prevent the then collapse or corruption or misrule of the currency even after they gain independence. 
they are neither forced to find some new monetary master by switching over to the dollar or the ruble or whatever other national currency, but nor do they have to take on the risk, an extremely difficult task, the fragile state of trying to bootstrap and secure their own new currency. Having never done it before and having huge centralized financial enemies that literally control all of the doorways into and out of the rest of the global financial world that is ultimately going to be the thing that sets the price of your brand new, immature, fledgling currency that the powers that be are pissed at you about and ready to smash. Those are no longer the two options. There is now a third. An independent, global, open source, completely borderless currency. A money that gives them the independence without having to manage their own money. If you understand anything about the history of money, you would, you would grasp how unbelievably powerful that is. And I hope this article helps to illustrate just how impactful that can be. And one of the craziest things is that Fode specifically is already trying to use the power of of independent money and censorship resistance to to fix another problem. This is where where we talk about everything stems from the money. So many problems are a result of not having free flow of finances, that you can't build out your own infrastructure, that you can't build your own freaking cell company. The this is this is one of the craziest things to me and and this is Again, it's one of those things that's not shocking, but it's just incredible to hear it. But, quote, Senegal's telecom gateways are controlled by France and can be shut down in the case that there are protests against the country's leader, whom they support as long as he sticks to the CIFA system. But it is possible to find endpoints, Fode said, through other providers. They can be national phone networks or even satellite connections. Fode created a box that would pick up on these other signals. Mobile phones could tunnel into that box, allowing users to go online even when the French turned off the internet. To incentivize people running such boxes, he would pay them in Bitcoin. For routing data and maintaining these boxes in Senegal, one is paid through lightning. This is what Fode is working on today. This is what we talk about when we say that Bitcoin is going to re-decentralize the internet. It is going to make funding and building out and establishing infrastructure in a way that wasn't possible before. And this is going to accelerate so much. If, if these countries can actually gain independence, if Bitcoin truly becomes the currency of decolonialization, they are going to, they're going to leapfrog. And this is what I, this is exactly what I talked about in the El Salvador piece. And it feels so good. It's just awesome to hear uh, Fode say the exact same thing. In this quote, this quote just got me while I was reading it. It says, when I go home, I see how people are being held down. But in the same way we leapfrogged landlines and went straight to cell phones, we're going to skip banks and go straight to Bitcoin. That is it. It is open source code. It is open and free infrastructure that they can build out and access by themselves. They don't need anybody's permission. They don't need anybody's whitelist. They don't need anybody's license. Nothing. They need a smartphone. They need a little computer box and they need a satellite dish. And that is it. They are plugged into a global frictionless monetary system. And they can build whatever the hell they want for it. They can code anything. And any one of them. Any just 50, 500 lines of solid ass code and a cool idea can change the whole world. And now they are plugged into this in a way that nobody else was before, or in a way that wasn't even close to possible from a financial system prior to this. It got, gets me thinking about impervious AI again, which, um, which I don't even think I've mentioned this really on the show. Um, I should probably do an episode on this, but check it out. Just look up impervious.ai uh, or their Bitcoin 2021 20, talk about what they're building. This is very much along the lines of essentially a, a service, an ability to create a service or um, pay for, you know, some sort of just just like this box he was talking about in Senegal. Um, it's just very much that it's an application. It's an open API and application layer on top of lightning. The number of things that we can build and redesign with this are, are going to be huge. They're kind of um, uh, 
their uh, what you call it prototype, their their uh, proof of concept was a VPN, uh, and it was really really fascinating because you actually used Lightning in order to establish the VPN or the SSH connection, whatever it is. So you create an encrypted tunnel, not using TCP/IP pings, not using like the clear net to find the other person and then establish the connection. You do it with directly over lightning so you're talking directly to their pub key over the lightning network the payment network is actually what gives you the tunnel to establish the connection elsewhere on the internet so it's there's never even a handshake that someone can read it is entirely encrypted from the start and you're using actually separate channels than the the surveilled and controlled uh a channel like let's say like the uh, french um the orange orange was the uh the telecom company you're not even using them to establish the connection so it is truly an unstoppable cryptographic handshake with another party and you start throwing in gotenna you get you get myers on this you get elizabeth stark on this when you start talking about all of the different things that we can actually do and build out something like a mesh net a, a real mesh net that these countries, that people in these sorts of situations and actually have to worry about censorship, actually have their internet, like, like literally their internet is cut off. Like we talk about like the US or, you know, China or whatever, nobody would have the balls to do that. But they literally do that in these countries to stamp out protests and to make sure that they keep their dictator in power. This doesn't have to be the case. This can be stopped. This can be fixed. This is a solvable problem. And then the second, just having a medium of exchange, just having that Bitcoin the network, but then to have it fold back on to Bitcoin the asset, which is, um, again, something that Lord Fisichua talked about, is that you, know, you end up using it for remittances. You use it because the Bitcoin network is open source and it gives you infrastructure that can't be shut down. But then you begin to see Bitcoin the asset. Then you begin to get comfortable with the idea of a sat rather than a penny or rather than a franc. And one, another really great quote that just, just got me reeling in this was, another effect he is seeing in Senegal is that when people are exposed to Bitcoin, they start saving. You know, our opinions, th th this, this needs to be something, when I talk about, <laughs> when I talk about money being something that it is literally at the base and economics drives all of our decisions that monetary the nature of our money changes the culture it changes the way we think it changes the way we frame ourselves and our struggles against the world the way that we value and exchange things touches everything that we do and this is the kind of thing i mean when i say that our opinions on this don't matter. What the culture thinks about Bitcoin doesn't really matter. The game theory plays out. The culture changes. You know, there is never, there's never been a time in history in which a hard money was introduced into a soft money environment or country or continent or whatever it is in which because the culture or because the people just really didn't want to use the hard money that it was never adopted. It is literally just a matter of time. The economics and the game theory take over. And that's what we're seeing. That's what this is. And the, the fact that they see that, you know, they, they start using this asset and they get this additional freedom, this, they get this additional choice over their own funds over their own control and what they what they want to do and where they want to spend their money and which service they want to use and which country they want their internet presence to be coming from or logging in from today then they see the price go up a little bit see it go up a little bit more and they realize that if they looked six months out they looked a year out and they held on to some of this what other plans could they have what might they build? What could they hope to do in the future that no middleman, no bank, no central bank, no French government could devalue or confiscate away? 
This is how you build a great society. You change people's time preferences. And for them to be able to look that far out, to be able to build and sustain that capital, to save that for tomorrow and then the next day and then next year, to look out and think about building 20-year projects rather than 20 days because you don't know what's going to happen on day 21. You reframe the whole world and all the possibilities just because you can save 10 cent that you know no one can take from you. That is your 10 cent. You are not subject to somebody else. It is not stopped because somebody else doesn't want you to send it somewhere and they don't take 90% of it in fees just to move it somewhere. The consequences of that change in how we see and think about our value and our future is not insignificant. And to give that to people or populations that are stuck hand to mouth and completely trapped in a short-term mindset stuck on the wheel is life-changing. And somebody like Fode, like their devotion to this should indicate just how life-changing it can be. Uh, this, this line just... If Fode ever listens to this, first, I hope I got your name right. I'm sorry if I butchered that like a billion times in this piece. Um, but just crazy, crazy props to this line of thinking. And I think this, this just shows, A, how impactful Bitcoin can be, and also just how bigger the, the goal, the mission of Bitcoin is, and how like a true Bitcoiner thinks about it. And he says, they could jail me, he said, but through the meetups, I'm making it so that I'm not a single point of failure. He's trying to make himself obsolete so that if they come after him, if they lock him in a cage, if they take his life away, they, they can't stop what he's trying to build. God damn it, man. That's, that's heart. Um, and he's got a lightning tip jar, and I am tipping the shit out of that today. Uh, oh, it's a strike tip jar. Hell yeah. I'll have the link to this in the show notes if you want to help him build out the meetups and the projects that he's working on. Because this, this is where the battleground is, right? Like, like these, are, these are the boots on the ground. This is, it, it, it's so funny that we, you know, we've talked years about the game theory and things like this. And, the, you know, smaller nations actually have the most to benefit from. Like, and, you know, openly discussed monetary colonialism. And the, these absurd controls and stipulations that are put on these smaller nations and basically make them completely subjugated to some other monetary power, to France, to the U.S., the petrodollar, to the yuan, to whatever it is. But this, this is the separation of money and state. This is the removal of all of those walls, the cutting of all the strings. And yes, that comes with volatility. Yes, that comes with risk. But what the hell else is worth risking for? You know, when we call Bitcoin a revolution, like we're serious. You know, we're absolutely serious. This is a revolution. This is going to change governments. This is going to change the monetary system. This is going to put so much pressure on the IMF, the World Bank, the Federal Reserve, the, the ECB, all of these institutions that have basically had their way over a whole subset of the globe, this is going to just start tearing cracks into everything that they do. And Gladstein, like, Farida, like, uh, these people are right. Like, they're not going to go down without a fight. They are going to do everything they can to demonize, to push back, to try to reassert their control over these countries. The same way, I, I mean, if they've openly supported dictators and military coups and manipulated elections for decades. You don't think they're going to make us, you think they're just going to roll over? They don't have any morals. They'll just spin whatever the hell they want that is in their favor and demonize the other alternative. That's it. They've been doing it for, they've been doing it since forever. That's the one thing that they really do all the time. So yeah, they're going to do it. But the beauty of Bitcoin and this 
this uh, the revolution that Bitcoin can instill, uh, that it can set a fire to, is and this is another great quote from the thing. And and you know Nick Carter has one of my favorite pieces I've ever read on this show. Um, the Bitcoin is a peaceful revolution. And this quote just embodies that exact thing. It says, but maybe instead of a violent revolution, it could be a gradual, peaceful revolution over time that kicks out colonialism. Not a sudden off switch, but a parallel system where people can opt in over time by themselves, Fode said. No coercion. This is about building a parallel system, and the beauty of it is that in any one country, it might not be big enough to worry about. But together, the fact that it's 1% of 20 different countries, that it's this small parallel system that people can make use of, that people can transact across the border freely, when you get a move like El Salvador, when you get a move, potentially, it looks like Paraguay might be following, they are going to, this is their time to strike, to get the independence they've been fighting for since the 60s, that they, li- they were lied to and told they were getting, and they just, had, they just had another bag pulled over their head. And this is a way to undo that, to get that independence finally, and to do it by combining their influence. Together they make Bitcoin stronger, Together, they are able to trade and move capital freely and establish their own prices, their own imports and exports. Yes, it's going to be a freaking mess. Yes, they're going to be attacked. But they can actually accumulate capital. They can actually build their own infrastructure. And they can actually build their way out of this by using a currency, a money for enemies, a currency of decolonialization. This is the dream. This is the mission. This is why we are here. And this is what Bitcoin means to the world. So I guess we'll, this, what is this episode? An hour and a half now? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, that'll do it. I didn't even think I was going to have a guy's take today. What a joke. How was, how was I going to read a Gladstein piece without a guy's take? Uh, so <laughs> thank you guys so much. Um, thank you, Bitcoin Magazine. Thank you, Bitbox, uh, Shift Crypto, the Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. Guys, it, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a volatile, crazy future. You gotta hold your own keys. Uh, get yourself a Bitbox. You get five percent off. Um, I love the device. I swear by it. And get a stable savings plan. You know, I don't. I didn't pick Bitbox and Swan Bitcoin for arbitrary reasons. I picked them because I use them because they are they are brands and and products that I trust and that I use all the time. So know that I don't take those rec- recommendations lightly. And it's gonna be a crazy future, and if I had any jobs that I felt like we all needed to do, it's run a node, hold your own keys, and stack the hell out of some sats. So with that, thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to Bitcoin Audible to stay up on all this craziness and learning everything about it. We have got, hopefully, I have Fingers crossed, I've got some really awesome interviews around the corner and so many great episodes to come. We are doubling down on Bitcoin Audible. So much to build, so much to do. Don't forget to check out guyswan.com and follow me on Twitter at the Guy Swan. I hope you are ready to build the peaceful revolution. And until next time, everybody, take it easy, guys. This has been Bitcoin Audible, a 111 production.